Well, good afternoon. We're in the book of Psalms. We're pilgrimage through the Psalms. I want to suggest to you as we continue our study uh, in the book of Psalms that uh, you pray with the psalmist as you uh, read through it. I, I believe that uh, reading the Psalms and especially these great prayers in the Psalm can help us in our own prayer life. We're looking today at Psalm chapter 6. And in Psalm chapter 6, there is this eruption of emotions. Uh, David, we presume to be the writer, is in deep distress. Much of the circumstances is due uh, to his own creation. I think sometimes we just wonder, how in the world did this ever happen to me? How in the world was I so stupid to get into these circumstances? What I'm suggesting to you is that uh, David is the creation of his own circumstances, and it's not just the circumstances he's facing, but uh, it reveals to us the uh, his his misery in these miserable circumstances. So let's take a, a quick look today at Psalm chapter 5. Now notice again, I need to stress this, in the Psalms, and especially the prayers, uh, the writers are pouring out their emotions fervently. And, and I want to suggest to you that prayer has an emotional element to it. The fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth not much. And so uh, we have to think about going beyond just the casual prayer sometimes, uh, where it's almost by road and it's it, it just uh, uh, descends into ritual, and that we need to have our heart in our prayers. Prayer is a tremendous thing to be able to go before God and uh, to pour out our hearts. And I want to suggest something else that just just need to, is that uh, no matter what happens in life, regardless of the circumstances, whether you're guilty or you're angry or you're frustrated, and we're going to see all this going on in the psalm, you can always turn to God. No matter what you have done, and no matter what has happened to you in life, no matter how you are feeling, you may be feeling that it's even wrong to go to God in prayer. But I want to encourage you that you go to God because you're going to see one thing about David in his life, no matter how much he messed up, uh, he was all he always turned to God, and I want you to be able to do that. <coughs> so let's look at Psalm chapter 6 real quickly today. In Psalm chapter 6, beginning in verse number 1, now remember, David is praying to God. He's pouring out his, his heart to God. And so he'll say, O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger. Now David is in need of rebuke. That's something foreign to most people today. But there are times where there is a great need to be rebuked and punished and chastised. And especially in our home and families today, that sometimes is absent. But there is an urgent need and a desperate need sometimes to face that. Now notice though, David says, don't do that, Lord, in thine anger. Now think about this. I know that sometimes in my anger, when my blood is boiling, when I'm really angry about something, there is the temptation and the danger to do some things that you regret doing. You may say things that you deeply regret. You may some do some things, yet God, you see, in his anger, even in his fierce anger, it's always controlled. And we read so much about people's anger sometimes that uh, so many things just really, really turn out very horrible. So, But David is saying to God, though he deserves to be rebuked, and though he though he got into this mess all by himself, that uh, uh, he he doesn't deserve, you see, to to uh, uh, escape any punishment. But what he's asking God is, don't do it in your anger, and do not chastise me in, in thine hot displeasure. That's a good prayer because sometimes we just know we deserve uh, uh, some very severe consequences. Sequences. And what he's asking God is, don't, please God, don't do it in your anger like that. Then verse two, 
it's interesting now watch because i want to stress this though david is guilty he's done some terrible things and he's in some real deep to trouble and, and he and if as we read further he's vexed about this i mean he is exhausted his he, mentally spiritually he's in deep depression his soul is anxious we'll read a little bit further he can't even sleep and yet you'll see in all of that that's going on he could still turn to god and ask god for mercy and so can you so he says in verse number two have mercy on me O lord for i am weak and isn't that true i mean he's almost fainting he's just worn out he's just exhausted and he says oh lord heal me for my bones are troubled they're vexed and what we would say in our way of speaking today he's he's in, he's just stressed he's burnt out uh it, it looks like there's no hope and so uh, you see he's saying that in he's at a low point and and again you know how uh, how when you can get into a low point where you're just so uh, so hopeless and yet you see in that state of desperation though he's created that himself he'll turn to god and ask for mercy now verse number 3 my soul is is sorely vexed now let me just widen the scope for just a moment uh, his life is like that just emotionally, mentally, spiritually, his his soul is troubled, and and it's amazing because when you talk about the soul, that's sort of the heat of the the rather the seat of all our emotions, our our and our mental faculties. And look, he's looking at the very core of his life and saying how 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 extremely uh, depressed and anxious. Uh, he is now what he goes on to say then is how long i mean how long haven't you ever wondered that how long can this go on you get it's been it's it's been so much time and it doesn't look like there's a way out and you don't think you can handle it anymore not even a day more and that's what he's saying how how long you know is it going to be and there he goes in verse four then he says return o lord deliver my soul there's an interesting thing about this uh, have you ever noticed sometimes uh, well, how about a simple illustration? You ever you ever open up a can of Coke or some kind of soda, and when when you open it up, it just uh, explodes. And what what really is happening here? He's asking God to be set free from all the burden and all the pressure and let the pressure be relieved and that that uh, that God will remove this burden of guilt and this burden of sin and and how it's how it's affecting his whole life I mean when I said the mental and the emotional and the physical state it, it's affecting every aspect of his life you can just see how what a difficult circumstances David is in now verse number five for in death, he says, there's no remembrance of thee. In the grave, there shall be no thanks. You know, what he's basically saying, if I die, I can no longer praise you. I thought about this verse. You know, we ought to take some real advantage, spiritually speaking, about being able to praise the Lord and serve the Lord and glorify the Lord in life. So many people, even religious people, sometimes fail to see that. Now, notice here in verse number six, I am weary. I'm exhausted and in my groaning i think he probably refers to uh his uh prayer life because you know you can pray and you can pray and you can pray and there's no answer and uh, so the prayer even gets into the depth of groaning now it could refer to the physical thing but i think what's really distressing him is the emotional as you read through it uh he's vexed he's troubled in, in every deep aspect of life now notice verse uh, six further and this is why i say this and all night i make my bed to swim now bed you know when you go to bed at night you go to sleep for rest but when david went to sleep at night he couldn't sleep and the reason he couldn't sleep was mentally and emotionally uh, the reason he could he says I water my bed with my tears I mean he goes to bed at night and not with joy and not with peace but he goes to bed at night and he's weeping all night 
And I believe that weeping had a lot to do with what he did. Now, verse number seven, my eyes are consumed. They're just worn out. I mean, you know, you sometimes I'm just, you know, you get worn out. You get tired of hearing the news. You get consumed. Some people are consumed with it, but it just, it's so vexing. It's sort of like Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah when those people who were homosexual, it just vexed him every day. The evil that people were doing vexed him. The way people did things vexed him. And when David, what he saw, Saul, you see, it vexed him deeply. And now let me tell you something. Uh, there's a lot of things going on today that trouble us in the same fashion. But David goes on, and I'm moving real quickly. But I weary with my groaning, and all the night I, and my bed is swimming in tears. I water my couch, he said, with my tears. Isn't that a sad, sad way to go to bed. Now notice verse uh, 8, depart from me. Now he's turning here. There's some things that are turning, and, and I want to just say this in this verse 8 and following. I want to encourage you to keep praying regardless of uh, whatever you believe about prayer, whatever you believe about your circumstances, because you're going to see if you keep praying, if you pray, there's always going to be an answer. And so what he says here is this is the turning point in the psalm. And he's saying, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Now, now he's not saying I'm going to abstain from these workers of iniquity, but he's confronting them who have been attacking him. Probably the assault is based upon David's weakness and the sins he committed. It's given them the occasion and the opportunity to assault him, to slander him. And what he's saying to them is, you stay away from me. Isn't that an interesting thing? Sometimes we don't want to stay away from people like that. But David is, is confronting them and telling them to depart from him. Don't want anything to do with those kind of people. And so he's saying, depart from me, you workers of iniquity for the Lord has heard my voice of weeping. See, there's the prayer of weeping. It's not the physical thing, as I mentioned just earlier, but he's weeping in prayer. He's weeping because of, of the sorrow and the remorse of the things that he's done. And so this is what causes him to be so depressed. And this is what brings anxiety to his soul. This is why he's afraid. And so he wants to go to God. He's asking God to release that and get the pressure and the burden off. And that finally comes and then he can confront his enemies even though he had done wrong. Let me give you a little difference. David had done some bad things. Anybody who read the Bible knows that, but he didn't live that way. He didn't practice those things. He messed up, yes, but you see, he repented of those and he turned to God. That's what I'm trying to say. No matter what your circumstances is, boy, if you can get this, I know there's some folks that need to hear this that because they've done things in their life, they deeply regret some of the things they've done in their life, and I'm trying to encourage you that even in that, take that to God, process it there. Don't turn away from him. Let the Lord know there's nothing hidden from him. Anyhow, he knows the, the deep, deep things of your heart. He knows what's on your heart. He knows what's what you're really genuine about. And a lot of times you see, I'm, I'm bringing that emotional thing out in prayer because uh, that when we're really being genuine about our life before God, I don't know how you can go through this journey without some emotion in your prayers. I mean, because there are things that have happened to you. There's things that happen to others. There's things going on all around us that demands an emotional response, and you're pouring this out to God. And whether it's happened to you, something has hurt you and wounded you, you can take that to the altar of God, to the throne of God, and process it there. It's so important for you to get this point that I'm telling you. Turn to God no matter what, no matter how guilty you are, no matter what you have done, no matter how terrible sin you've committed, you can always turn to God and pour out your heart there and leave it there. Now notice verse 9. And the Lord heard my supplication, and the Lord will hear my prayer. You remember we talked yesterday that when we pray, we're just not echoing words. Sometimes people just do that. They have no meaning in their words. There's no sincerity in their words. They're just saying words. And here you see in this great psalm, and let me just remind you and, and encourage you to pray with the psalms in the book of Psalms. As you read that, you see you can go to this psalm and you can read 
reach in the deep recesses of your heart and deal with that with the Lord and ask the Lord for forgiveness. And then you can walk, you see, in spite of the enemies. Notice what he says about them. Uh, because now, remember, the enemies aren't people that just stumble. Christians do stumble and sometimes they do some bad things, but they don't live a life like that. These enemies who are confronting David because of whatever David had done, and some people you see just never never let up on that. They see somebody did something wrong and they try to hold it against them all their life. And David is telling those kind of enemies, yeah, I messed up, but I went to God and God forgave me. I'm on a new life. I'm walking a new life. Leave me alone. Depart from me. Sometimes we need to tell some folks that. Now, what he's going to say about the enemies who do not repent, who walk that way, who are workers of iniquity. I think this is an important thing to learn, especially in the world we live today, because I don't think a lot of folks really believe this. Notice what he says, let mine enemies be ashamed and be exceedingly fearful. Let them fall back. See, they're not falling back when they thought they didn't have to fall back. They're on the attack. But David's saying, fall back and be ashamed suddenly. Let me read you a, a verse real quickly, and then we're going to conclude our lesson today. But notice this. In 2 Thessalonians, the same thing was happening to the church of Thessalonica. The brethren there were being assaulted by the enemy. They were being slandered. They were being persecuted. That's down in verse 7, because he talks about about there are people who trouble you. And about notice this though, that God's going to take care of that. I mean, the day is going to come when God is going to deal with his enemies of God, the enemies of God's people. And he says he's going to take vengeance on them in flaming fire. And, and that uh, he's going to bring sudden vengeance upon them, just like the psalmist said. They will be ashamed. They will be disappointed. There will be great confusion, but he goes on to say about us, you hang in there now, you hang in there, and I am wanting to just emphasize this so much that you begin a devout life of prayer daily, and you deal with circumstances in life before God, and if you'll do that, you'll find that your life will be much, much richer. Hey, these Psalms are pretty good. Uh, praying through the Psalms and learning how to pray and how to pray where you deepen your relationship with God. We'll be looking at Psalm chapter uh, 7 tomorrow, and so I hope you'll be with us at noon. Hey, have a good day.